Oh. So like we were rushing today because uh we had a we had a, a timeline to work with and there's a guy that was on the machine that I need I I wanted to do this one maneuver and it, it, he just wouldn't get off. He wouldn't get off the goddamn machine. He was just texting and texting and texting. I was working out by the way. It, was just, it wasn't like a it wasn't like a it you're wasn't in, like a Okay. You're in the gym. I was in the gym. Get my Again, get painting my fi- paint, painting pictures. Get my fitness on. And I was like, you know what would be perfect to solve this problem right now? Blood arts. <laughs> I need a blood art, like right now. I mean, that seems to be the solution of choice to a great many things. Blood arts. Um, for the, for those of you that aren't <laughs> aren't catching the 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 joke uh, this week, Project Veritas uh, released another gem of a Should we play it for him? of an undercover video. No, just it's a quick hit. Too long. It's just like little, thir- no, fourteen just hit minutes. Hit him with the anyway. Project Veritas caught a put a link a, in the an economist. Notes. Yes, the link will be in the show notes. Um, an economist that works for the FDA, whose solution to the vax hesitant or whatever is, in his words, what David? What's what are we gonna do? Blood arts. We have drones <laughs> and like just shoot everybody with blood arts. Yeah. Oh. Oh. And in addition to the blow darts, he did admit that a national registry of the unvaccinated probably sounds a little Germany ish. Um, and I believe. For as much as libertarians caught hell for bringing up the star David, you know, with the whole vaccine passport thing. He went right to it. He went right to it. He's like, yeah, it sounds kind of Germanish and it's a little bit of the yellow star, but, you know, we just got to do it. Can I? I mean. And once everybody's registered, he's going to hit him with what, David? Blood arts. (laughs) Motherfucking blood arts. And if you're wondering why David's talking like that. Go to the show notes page, which will be at wmdpodcast.com backslash 62 and click on the first link. I just ask, how friendly do you think Nazi Germany, who he's supporting right now, by the way, would have, you know, yeah, about him? You know. Anywho. Listen, just say. Listen, that's not us. Glass houses. That's not us proving Godwin's law or anything like that. Glass houses. He brought that comparison on himself. Go ahead and leave those rocks where they're sitting. (laughs) That's all we're saying. But Dane, we have something special to talk about today. Do we now? Oh, we do. So it wasn't, you know, we made you wait a long time for grandma. But you know what? now they're coming you thick know, and fast. That's right. Now everybody wants to get on the show. We knew gra- we, we were going to get the grandma. We bump. already had the in. We yeah. knew some people. Yeah, we got the, we got the grandma bump. So um, we have a special guest today and we're going to introduce him on the other side of the intro. So David, should we jump in? Let's jump in. Double bump. Double, double, double bump. Double bump. Double, double, double bump. Are you, your, and, are, and the are you done? Yeah, oh, okay. I, I, don't, I was going to rap after that. <laughs> uh, I'm going to feign to be a rapper. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, we want to start out this episode with an apology. We picked you a it. whole bouquet of oopsie daisies. <laughs> Yes. So if you're wondering, uh, you're now hearing episode 62 and you're wondering, hey, wasn't that supposed to be last Monday? Where was my episode? Um, In true Dane and David fashion, we had one hell of a kerfuffle. David, what happened? Well, if you were slightly discomforted by what happened last week, only imagine our surprise when we had one of the best interviews that we've had so far, aside from grandma, that's always going to be number one. Of course. But uh larry sharp dropped some knowledge and we we're like so excited to get that knowledge spread amongst the masses out to y'all asap out to all five of you and <laughs> we it was 1 30 on a sunday slash monday morning and okay we don't need intimate details i know i know picture, picture I'm, I'm, ju- I'm just i'm, I'm just i'm 20 <laughs> and that's the exact time when <laughs> shit went awry and since then, we've been struggling to keep this, you know, whatever wacky wagon this is afloat. So go ahead, Dane. If this is the Oregon Trail, at least three of us were died of dysentery, a snake bite, and drowned in a river crossing. That's it. See, I know you people hear our episodes and you're thinking, man, this sounds so crisp and clean. These guys must have one hell of an awesome studio. But we're not joking. When we tell you the level of technology we're working with. And how savvy we are with working with it. <laughs> um, I mean, the sound quality, you know, you have Chris over at Podsworth to thank for that. He saves our bacon more often than not. Um, but yeah, sometimes even our stuff, 
get, goes down so catastrophically, the hard drive in, in our computer basically fried and we couldn't get the audio over to Chris. And so after dealing with Geek Squad for three or four days, we finally got a functional computer and we got the Larry Sharp interview over to Chris and that's what you're getting this week. But we have, we're sorry gifts, David. We've got what's known in the industry as bonus content. <laughs> so you might have heard us mention the Solutionary Summit a couple of times back pre-September 3rd. And then at September 3rd through 5th, we recorded a couple of uh, interviews with uh, pundits of that particular um, event. I would say that it wouldn't be speaking out of turn to say that these are people that are in the broader liberty movement. Um, they may not consider themselves libertarians. I don't know. We didn't ask that in the interviews, but um, they are doing things in the broader liberty movement, um, you know, more limited government, you know, that kind of stuff uh, that we thought they had good messages for you. So, so we thought because we dropped the chalupa on the floor, let's not give <laughs> them another chalupa. Let's give them a chalupa, a couple of tacos, and maybe a little uh, salsa Ooh, verde What was, it, what was your favorite it. thing you had? Like the soft crunch wraps? Or like, oh, the dirty... Oh, we ate like five of those and then shit our britches. Um, the <laughs> those cheesy those gordita were, crunch. Yes, oh, God. That was your favorite. The, if, back when I'd eat shit like that, holy God, it had the crunch, it had the smush, it, it was good. Any, but then, anyway, the dysentery <laughs> that followed was magnanim, was gigantic. Anyway, so today, you're going to get Larry, and... This was supposed to be an apology, and we've mentioned shitting a couple of times. Yeah, so stop doing that. Sorry. You just, you just you did make it, it again. You make it, what? <laughs> Um, and then for the rest of the week, Tuesday through Friday, you're going to get one episode a day uh, from one of the four people that we interviewed at the Solutionary Summit. So um, this is our apology week slash interview week slash we think we're getting kind of good at this thing. <laughs> Aside from the technology. <laughs> Aside from the fact that we just missed our we're first We're good at talking. <laughs> we're really good at talking. We're getting right. it down pat. So The thing that we've been doing since two. With that said, let's jump into the jump in. Welcome to Weapons of Meme Destruction Podcast, episode 62, uh, which can be found at WMD bod, wmdpodcast.com. We're launching a podcast <laughs> later. Yes. So. It'll, it'll start with the calendar. Right. Um, WMD, wmdpodcast.com backslash 62. You can also find us on YouTube. You can get the, the videos there. Any podcast catcher, but also link up with us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Which is why I was working out before, because I'm getting ready for that calendar yes. the photo shoot. Correct. Today's guest is Larry Sharp. Uh, anybody that's even in the broader liter liberty movement probably already recognized that name, but for anybody that doesn't, uh, he ran for the Libertarian vice presidential nomination in 2016 and then ran for governor of New York as a Libertarian in 2018. Um, Larry is one of the better messengers in the Liberty Movement, and that's why we were just thrilled to be able to bring him to you um, in an interview about what does libertarian messaging look like in the age of COVID? And, you know, we get into some broad stuff, too, with, you know, libertarians have struggled with messaging in the past, but Larry is one of those master um, communicators, and so we think we could definitely learn from him. We think you listeners. He's from can New as well. York. If you can't tell within the first five seconds, but he thinks fast and he talks fast, and he's got a lot of good things to say. So let's welcome him in, Mr. Sharp. Welcome to the show. How are you this evening? I'm great. Glad that I'm so glad you guys had me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, you know, the, the audience kind of got a bit of a sneak peek in some past episodes. We, we told them we went to the Solutionary Summit this year uh, in Miami. Uh, we were fortunate enough to meet you there. And, uh, you know, gracious, gracious, you graciously accepted our invite to the show. So thank you for thank you for coming on. I love it. No, you got right to the source. So it was easy. 
Exactly, exactly. So, um, you know, the, kind of what we wanted to talk about in this episode, because, you know, in, in my opinion, uh, being around the liberty movement for a few years now, um, mm-hmm. you are one of the best, one of the better messengers we have in terms of, you know, kind of a broad appeal, being able to speak to a wide uh, a, a wide group of audiences and, you know, not turn them off. Cause I mean, let's be honest, a lot of libertarians do do that. Um, it's true. Yeah. Guilty and, is charged. <laughs> and so we wanted to kind of just learn from you and, and, you know, take your experiences in, in the different areas that you've been in and kind of introduce them to our audience because, um, you know, we can learn well, stuff from you. Let me ask you a too. question. Who, who are the people who are listening or watching right now? Usually. Um, our moms. <laughs> okay. Your moms. I love that. That's important. No. And let me, yeah. let me, let me bring that up. Cause that's an important issue. Please. Our moms vote. Yeah. So yeah. our moms matter tremendously, right? Our moms yeah. vote. That's David. That's brilliant. I'm very happy you said that because <laughs> we got to stop trying to make sure that the only people we get are young males, right? Yes. Right. We got, I want us to get the moms. Moms are important. And let me tell you what moms care about. Freedom. No, that's not true. They don't care about freedom at all. Right. Not, they don't care at all about freedom. It's not their issue. What they care about is, are you going to solve my problems? That's what they care about. And if you're not going to solve my problems, will you make me feel, depending upon where my head is, safe? Safe is a different emotion depending upon where you come from, right? right. If you're more conservative, safe means things aren't going to change. Right. If you're more liberal, okay, you're not going to attack people for being different. Does that make sense? So right. it depends upon where you come from, but both equal safe in that mom's mind. So first right. of all, are you going to solve my problems? Second thing, are you going to, uh, can I be safe? So when you're talking to moms, don't talk about theory. Theory doesn't matter. Instead, talk to a mom about how you can solve their problem. If they seem skeptical, skeptical, ask them, is the current system solving their problem? And they'll always say no, because it doesn't. Right. Right. So say your mom's problem right now is, I'm making this up, if, if your mom is older, is she's worried about retiring. Right. That's her concern. She's worried right. about retiring. Right. Can I retire in the state that I live in right now? I don't want to leave my kids wherever they are, or I don't want to move to some place. I don't want to go to an old folks home or whatever is the thing she cares about. Right. Or can and I travel to see is, them if I have to? Yes, am I going to have to travel to go see right. my kids? Whatever, right? right. right? These are the things they care about. Hayek didn't discuss this. Neither did Bastiat. Right. Right? So let's not worry about that. Right. Instead, I want to say things like, as an example, what do you think about an idea to where if you were living in your home now and you retired, that maybe you didn't have to pay any income tax? Would that make it easier for you to stay where you are now and maybe have some extra cash in your pocket so you can travel and see your kids if they go to a different city? Right. And she goes, wow, that's, that's good. Yeah, that'd be interesting, right? Like, I mean, if, if, you, if you were able to do that, it would encourage people, you know, who are over 65 and retired to stay in the area, which maybe that might mean there might be more hospital care and more medical right. care in that, because there'd be more of a you know, group of people who could, who could, who'd want those services. I bet a bunch more people would be in that area. You'd probably have better, better medical service too. They'd be like, right. so that's great. Oh my God, yeah. So what you're saying now, what is, that, I just, is that bringing it back home is how, you, is how you get the voter. Instead of talking about the explicit you know, policies that it makes libertarians libertarians, just bringing it back home. Well, I home, did talk about a policy. I'm talking about right, cutting, exactly. I'm, talking, I'm literally talking about cutting exactly. um, uh, uh, property tax when you're 65 years old. That's definitely right. libertarian. Right. Yeah. But I didn't say that. I didn't go, you know, government should give you tax breaks. They don't want to hear it. That doesn't make yeah. any sense to them. Yeah. When they hear that rhetoric, they go, oh, you just want to make the rich people richer. That's all they hear. But I didn't right. say that. I said, what right. about you? What if you say didn't have to pay any property tax, or maybe even half your property tax when you're 65, and then you had some extra cash. You could stay here, retire here. Your family your fam could come. You had some extra cash maybe to, to, to fix up that room, right? Not, your, not just on a daughter's gone, fix the room up, make it a den. Or maybe put, a, you know, put another thing on top of your, your um, a guest room, on top of your uh, garage, so when, when your son comes home, he has a place to stay. That's on his own. How about that? 
Anything right. that I'm going to make up. And now they start going, yeah, how do you do that? Then you discuss policy. Right. Now, if they care about that, then they're going to say, so you must be a, and if they're a Democrat, they will say Democrat. Mm -hmm. And if you're, they're Republican, they will say Republican. And that's when you're winning. When they right. think you are who they are, you're, you're on winning. My side. Right. Correct. Now you go, actually, I'm a libertarian. And now we can talk philosophy. It's yeah. steps is all right. I'm saying. Does mom want to hear philosophy? Sure. Just not up front. Right. Right. So the, uh, the spoonful of sugar helps yes. the medicine go down. Got it. Absolutely. Now, 100%. For you know the the more it's steeped in the libertarianness of uh, of our audience, they will probably know that you ran for governor of New York in what 2016, I believe, or no, VP of the party in 2016, and then and yep. then New York in 2018. Um, yes. You know, in, in 2016, I almost stopped Bill Weld from being our our um, VP. Almost, mm -hmm. I was 31 votes away. That would not have been that glorious. I counted. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> counting. David, no. I didn't count. You're counting, David, not me. All right, Dave, stop. <laughs> I didn't count. You're counting. It's not my okay. strong suit. I don't care. Anyone that knows me is not. It's not my strong suit. <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> that would have, that that would have been glorious. Um, but employ. I'm I'm assuming in both of those campaigns. Um, you know, obviously when you're running for governor of New York, maybe your your strategy or maybe your messaging or the things that you talk about is different than when you're running for a position. Um, within the part, the Libertarian Party. Oh, well, totally. Was it different at different. all? Yeah. So can totally you talk different. a little bit about not that? E not even close. Um, running for the VP is an internal run. It's, I don't really consider it running. It's internal, right? So I don't really consider that running. Um, okay. I consider running once you've got the nomination. That's how I – so I, li I only consider that I ran once. In 2016, I spent, my, I spent my own money. I spent like four or five grand. I forgot what it was on my campaign total. It was like a, a one-month campaign. And if anybody wants to win something in the Libertarian Party internally, there's one important phrase you have to really think about. It's called coalition building. Hmm. If you can't build a coalition, you're probably not going to win. Trying to hurt all these cats. Yes, if you yeah. can't hurt the cats. Yes, right. you, should, you should think about the liberty movement as, as the old Mongol empire. And I'm serious when I say this. Right. We're all raiders, off fighting off our own little worlds. And when there's a big, you know, guy to fight, let's go invade China. All the <laughs> Mongols get together and we go go invade China, right? Oh, right. let's go get the Eastern Europeans. The Mongols get together and go beat up the Eastern Europeans. We're ready to go, right? Whatever. We're right. all yeah. But when there's when there's no enemy, we just fight amongst ourselves and break up break up into little conates. Right. Which which so drives you've me. You've got to be able to build the coalitions. Right. And that drives me crazy because to your point is, I mean, your analogy is on point is that we have enemies everywhere and yes. yet we still find time to fight with each other over, you know, very marginal portions of the electorate. And it just, it, I, I don't understand that because we, if we were truly acting like the Mongols and we could like direct all of our focus in one direction, maybe we could take out one enemy at a time. But I, so where do you think that comes from? All of that infighting, despite being surrounded by enemies that s hold none of our worldview and we're fighting with people that deviate from us 5%. There are, there are two parts to this argument uh, or one ish issue. One of them is, you know, we've been around for 50 years. We've been losing elections and winning arguments for 15 years, for 50 years. And we're good at winning arguments. Yeah. So we're good at. <laughs> so we're not good at winning elections. That's not our skill set, right? But we're really right. good at arguing. So we do what we're good at. That's what happens, right? If you're if you're good at running, you're probably gonna be a runner. If you right, if you're True. good at playing basketball, you're gonna play basketball, right? You're good at it. You're probably right. gonna play it because you're good at it. So right. we're good at arguing. We win arguments all the time. We don't win hearts and minds or votes, but man, do we win arguments. So we do it. That's number one. But there's a bigger piece. That's kind of a joking piece, but it goes to the other piece. The party was begun, it started as an activist party. It wasn't started to win elections, right? And, and that drives people crazy when I say it, but that's the truth. It began not to win elections, but to be an activist party. So it's full of activists and we have that in our party. And I love our activists. We need our activists. Without our activists, there's no party. There's no movement. Right. So we need them. Like any other organization, though, you also need other parts, right? You need marketing and sales and operations and customer service, right? You need all parts of a business to make it work. Mm -hmm. We're really heavy on activists. So we act like an activist party. 
And activists are always getting attention. Pay attention to me, which is important. That's why they're good. What we're lacking is things like candidates, fundraisers, right? The other aspects of a party is where we lack. We still have some, but we don't have enough. And so what usually happens is we, we fill those spots with other activists who haven't changed the hat, who haven't said, oh, now I'm a fundraiser. I'm not an activist. Take the activist hat off, put the fundraiser hat on, raise some funds, then put the activist hat back on, be an activist again, right? Kind of I'm a back. candidate now, put the candidate hat on. Okay, now I'm not going to put the activist hat back on. We tend to keep the activism going throughout, and that will sometimes get us all to be loud. And then, of course, we're fighting because my issue is more important than your issue because kind I'm an going activist. Back to what you were saying before, instead of you know reaching out and dumbing it down so that they know and you pull them in, they're still just harping the issues and so on and so forth. Not winning the hearts and minds, yes. pretty much. Yes. And generally speaking, this is not a 100% rule, but it's a good general rule. Most people come into the movement because they heard somebody say something that made sense. And usually it's a candidate. It's not always a candidate. It's sometimes right. an activist, but it's often a candidate, right? A candidate said Ron Paul, um, Gary Johnson, insert person here, right? Harry Brown, right? Some person said something that made some sense and they went, huh, who are these guys? Yeah. Okay, let me check them out. So we need more people that will say something that makes sense to somebody so they come looking at us, which right. is why you, you rarely hear me critique messaging. People often do when they get mad at me. Why don't you get mad at people for messaging? Because I think actually all messaging works just depends upon who, who the audience is. Right. And My piece is always the same thing. When you're talking to people, who's your audience? That's why when you asked me to, to say something, I said, Who's listening? Right. And you said your mom. So I spoke that way <laughs> to you your mom, right? Right. But it right. depends on who's listening. If it's if if it maybe it's some, you know, some young some young vet who just got out of the military and is unhappy, I may say, you know what? Wouldn't you like to end the damn wars? And he might be like, Yeah, I would love to end the damn wars. Boom. Right. That message works perfect for him. It may not work with your mom. Right. Or would you like us to take care of you after you went over there and Got blown up? Just an idea. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Actually but deliver again, if, if on it's a our vet, end of the promise. But yeah. remember, if it's a vet, no. Do you want me to take care of your brothers and sisters? The vet is going to be modest yeah. and not ask for help. Yeah. Ah. That's true. Right? And that's right. Uh, that's my point. Know your audience. Get, right. If it's to a vet, I don't want to say help you. He's going to say no, I don't need any help. Yeah. Don't you mean to help your brothers and sisters? Yes. I want you to help them. Yes. Right. Perfect. And that's my point. Know your audience. And you brought up something earlier when you were when you were talking about the, you know, when we were talking about talking to the moms and stuff like that. And, you know, you might be talking to her and then but then as soon as it as you say, and some people are just they're gonna put their blinders up as soon as you say libertarian, that's like an evil word. And that reminds me of I think what was it earlier this month or late last month. You had a bit of a social media kerfuffle with a, a Lisa Simpson meme, and I, yep. when I saw that, you know, I I read the the cancer that was all throughout those comments too, and uh, yep. and I wanted you to talk a little bit about that because you know if even even if you don't self identify as libertarian, you know, if you say anything remotely pro freedom, we just get these like NPC rehearsed responses. And, um, and, you know, like I said, again, part of being a, a master messenger or, you know, communicator like you are, you know, you're able to deflect those, but also engage with the ones that seem a little more sincere. And just, you know, before you, you answer it, I do want to just read off the meme for the, the listeners. Please. Um, if, if they, they didn't see it, but uh, you posted it on uh, your Facebook page and the meme is what part of libertarianism bothers you? The part where you have to make decisions about your own life or the part where you don't get to make my decisions for me. Now, that seems rather benign as far as it goes. But man, did that send people into a tizzy? Can, can you talk a little bit about that and, and how you handled you know, that situation? I am so jealous. I can't do that every day. I wish <laughs> I could figure out how to do that every day. It is I mean, fun. it's just crazy. <laughs> I, I wish I could do it every day. I literally did yeah. an entire show just on that meme, right? I did my short way show, a two-hour show, just on that meme, answering that stuff, going back and forth. I just went down the list and just started answering stuff. Right. But the we have a serious 
disadvantage. It's a handicap. And it's the, the media. It is, one, how we are seen, and two, how they continue to see us. It's a handicap. We can be mad if we want to. It's yell it, it's not fair. It's true. It's not fair. It's not going to change. The only way we change this is by being more popular and people seeing through it finally. It will take time. This is not going to happen tomorrow. This is probably going to happen years from now. But you see, I keep doing it, right? I right. keep being the compassionate libertarian. I keep being the guy who is trying to solve your problems. I keep doing it, even though I get hammered all the time. To if you've seen that. me, I've gone on. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, to speak to that, like from our view point, I guess you'd call it, it, it becomes almost discouraging to be like yep. looking at both of these parties and seeing what they've done over the years and seeing how inept they've actually been on a lot of these issues that affect us every day. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if the proof isn't in the pudding by now, that you need to start looking for other options, that that's the only reasonable, that they still look at it as insane right, to me, say that a third party would happen. How do you, how do you keep it going? Let me grab, let me go right to yours, David. I can get back to what you said, David. Let me grab what David is right now. Right, go ahead. This is a very valid point. So if you notice, whenever I start talking, I said I'm going to be the compassionate guy, right? I'm trying to solve problems. The first thing they always do is they try to compare my response to perfection. Always. Right? Right. And I don't allow them to. I go, not to perfection, to the status quo. Is it better than what we have now? Well, with yours, people will die. People are dying now. Right. Well, with your foreign policy, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll be at war. We're at war now. Well, with your foreign policy, there'll be chaos in the Middle East. There's chaos in the Middle East now, right? I mean, compare right. it to now is what I'm saying. It, it, right. Not to perfection. You're going to compare to perfection. Your guy isn't doing very well either, right, right. compared to perfection. So yeah. compare it to now. What's happening now? And then I ask them, and what's the plan for Democrats or Republicans? Depending on where they are. And there never is one. Because right now, here is how Democrats and Republicans actually solve problems. Hey, Democrat, how are you going to solve education? By caring and giving people what they need. Awesome. How? By needing and caring and giving. <laughs> Great. How? By caring and giving. Right? Okay, it's Republican, right. how are you going to do it? By caring and giving. How? But by caring and giving. Giving and giving. And... The Republicans will use the word invest. Democrats will use the word fund. But all they both mean is throw more money at the problem. Exactly. Or they'll use instead, they'll use things like, you know, phrases like, you know, school choice, which means nothing. That's just a thing people say to say that I'm on that side. They don't actually have a plan for that at all. There's no plan for it. It's just school choice or, you know, teacher salaries, support the unions or whatever. That's just stuff people say. There's no plan for any of that. Right. Now, if I give you an actual plan, they go, uh, 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 yeah, I gave you an actual plan to make something better. And I've got to keep pushing that narrative. And every time they try to go towards perfection, I don't, I don't go there. Or whenever they go down to the extreme, so then nobody should have education ever, they go down that extreme always, right? They yeah. either go to perfection or down the extreme. It's black or white. Correct. And when they go down the extreme... That's when I questioned him. I said, when did I say that? You made that up. Did you just make that up? Who said that? <laughs> you want no education at all? Who said that? Right? Yeah. I don't even go down that road. Libertarians will. They'll fall down that trap all the time. <laughs> well, if we don't, then the market will. And they'll do that in saying stuff that nobody understands and gets. Yeah. I don't go down that road at all. Right. So right. I don't have to defend the market. I don't need to. I just yeah. have to defend my plan compared to the status quo. Yeah. That's all I got to do. And that's all I ever do. You never see me defend anything except for my plan against status quo. If you do that, you can have a conversation. They'll still be mad at you because to your point, David, it's not fair. They, they, the assumption is you are selfish. The assumption is you are crazy. The assumption is you can't win. That's the assumption. Mm -hmm. So I have to fight against that constantly. And it is absolutely, it takes time and energy. And that's why most people quit. Yeah. If you've seen our party, what happens usually is somebody runs, they don't do as well as they wanted, 
and they go away. That's the norm. Now, whatever you might think about Joe or Spike, some people love Joe, some hate Joe, some people love Spike, some people hate Spike, but whatever you think of them, they're the first ones to not go away. I am very happy about that. Right. Because whether people like or don't like them, whatever they feel, they're here and they've kept people and the people who like them have stayed. So I'm glad, Joe and Spike, I'm glad you stayed. And whoever on <laughs> 2024, please stay. And 2028, please stay. We need to keep the people in here because they right. help us in fundraising. They help us with institutional knowledge. They help us with, with name recognition. I want them to stay. And that to me is the best sign. We are finally getting homegrown candidates to run and to stay active in the party. I thought I was one of the first ones to actually do that from 2018. And now 2020, they're copying. And yeah. they got to keep copying. They should stay. Right. And, you know, on that on that messaging, and like I said, the the kind of, you know, double-digit IQ responses you got to that, that Lisa Simpson meme from a lot of people, um, how much of it do you think is we're just fighting uh, – almost insurmount, nothing's insurmountable, but, you know, an almost insurmountable uphill battle when we consider that, you know, 95% of all people in the United States are educated in the public school system. So the state gets them from very early on and inculcates ideas like everything that's great flows from the state. State doesn't do anything wrong. Anytime something's bad happened is when people had a little too much freedom, you know, so a lot of those, pro those responses are pre-programmed. And so we're fighting that. But also how much of it is our fault in terms of not doing outreach in the right way and perhaps being too abrasive and stuff like that? Because I've gotten this personal critique of myself from, from friends and stuff like that. The reason why I tend to uh, not intentionally be abrasive, but be a little more like in your face with stuff, like call things stupid when they're stupid, right? Call a spade a spade. And the reason why I do that is because it worked on me. You know, in the early 2000s, shortly after 9-11, it was all, you know, we got to go do this. We got I wouldn't say I was a neocon, but, you know, I definitely imbibed their talking points until Ron Paul came along. And it was like, yeah, I was wrong. And then I changed. But I had to be, I, nobody politely walked me by the hand with it. They beat me over the head with how wrong I was. And I changed. So it worked on me. So I think that works on some people. So That was my point from earlier. I'm yeah. not against any messaging. Different okay. <laughs> people get affected by different things. You, you, you're you, exactly my point. Yeah. I look at myself. I was brought in by Gary Johnson. When I first heard Gary Johnson speak, I thought he was a radical. He's not a radical. I'm <laughs> far more radical than Gary Johnson is now. Mm -hmm. But that's where my head was back then. My, If I would have heard any ANCAP speak in, in, in 2012, I'd have thought, that guy's nuts. Now they're my friends. Right. So everyone needs a different thing. You needed, hey, Hammer, look, I needed, hey, I'm a businessman like you, Larry. That's what I needed. Mm -hmm. We all need different things. And the moms need different things and the, and the vets need different things. I'm, that's why I'm, I don't get mad at people for having harsh messaging. Some, if you're talking to young college kids, you start yelling in the Fed, that works for a lot of young college kids. Yeah. That works. But now you're taking some, some, some banker who's been working for the Fed for 10 years? You don't want to hear that. <laughs> right. <laughs> you don't want to hear that at all. You're attacking That's job security. Right yeah. That's exactly right. You don't want to hear that. Yeah. So I, I really think it, it, it all depends. Um, I don't think you should necessarily be abrasive or not. I don't think that that's, that's the issue. You're saying there's a difference between being a jerk and being forward. Right. You can be forward and not be a jerk. Right? You can tell someone they're wrong without telling them that they're stupid. Right. You see where I'm going with that? That would be my only critique is you don't have to be personal when you're being forward. Sometimes a more forward message is going to work. Sometimes people shut off to the forward message. It's fine. Mm -hmm. All I'm saying is you don't have to be a jerk when you do it. Right. Right. You can go, David, you're wrong. That's not how it works, man. Let me show you how it works. That's forward. But that's not going, David, you jerk. Why are you so <laughs> stupid? Right. I don't have to say that. I don't have to add the jerk and stupid part. Right. I can just say, dude, you're wrong. Let me tell you, what's, this is how it works. Open your eyes, man. Here's how it works. I can do that without being a jerk. And the problem is we often go into the insult. And as long as we can avoid the insult and avoid that, I think strong messages can work and can fail. It depends upon your audience. All I would say, again, is know, know your audience and try not to be insulting.
Right. I think yeah. we'll be fine. Yeah, it's definitely not something you want to lead with. But like you said, when you get into some of those, like I said, the comments that you had on the, the Lisa Simpson uh, meme is like some people are so disingenuous. Uh, but hold s- on. I got to go back. Let me go back to that. Okay. I was not in any way arguing on that page for those people. I was arguing for everyone watching. Right. I, those, I'm not going to change those people. They're going to be like, my God, Larry, valid point. I'm a libertarian now. None of them are going to do that. I was totally aware of that. That was not going to happen. <laughs> right. right. And then, oh, oh, you, touche, Mr. Sharp. Where do I sign up? I don't think any of that was going to happen. But there were literally thousands of people watching that. And that's the thing that we as libertarians often don't get. We're so worried about winning the argument. Right. And I'll give you the, this is not libertarian. But I'll give you the, one, of the, one of the harshest one I, I had this when I was running for office. I had, a, I had a racial issue. And I had one guy just go on my page and give me a list of racial slurs. Just a hard, you're a blah, blah, insert every horrible racial slur all the way. He said stupid, sorry, stupid and in all these, every racial slur you can imagine. Mm-hmm. I take it down. Not at all. My response was stupid, ah, that's it. <laughs> That's my response. Yeah. That was it. So, That's my response. Yeah, I mean, he and lost as soon was, as he put that. Everybody saw that and was like, huh. What they heard, what they saw was, Larry can take a punch. That's what they saw. Larry can take a punch. Yeah. So He doesn't have to strike back. He can take a punch. And then of, other people defended me. Right. But I took the punch. So what, did, did that guy all of a sudden go, oh, voting for you now. No, of course not. He still hates me. Probably to this day, he probably still hates me, right? But I was doing it for the other people watching. When I did the, when I did the uh, show on that meme that was so popular, we actually tagged the people saying that I'm going to do the show, hoping they would show up. We tagged them on Facebook. Come on in. I'm going to tell you. I'm, come on in. It's I'll put you on a show. I'm, I'll, I'll let you in. You can talk to me if you want to. I did see that. Did anybody show up? Because I didn't not, see the whole two hours, but did anybody show up? No one. Of course not. Nobody no. did. <laughs> and that's okay. But every single person saw, again, I'm prepared to talk. Right. That was for everybody. That wasn't for them. I didn't think anybody. I was hoping one would show up. Oh, my God. It'd be amazing. I, I wish they would. Yeah. If you watched, I have gone to... I've got, I put myself into environments that are not exactly friendly environments more than once. And I do it on purpose. And I go in and I show people I'm here to talk, right? Literally, I've gone to democratic socialist events. I want to be there. I want to hear what they have to say, talk to them. I'm here. I'm not running. Mm -hmm. Look, the reason why I do it is several fold. One, other people are watching. And to your point, David, they're their current ways are not going to work. They're going to fail because they always fail. And when they fail, they have three options. Convert to the opposite, right? I was Democrat, now I'm Republican or whatever, right? That's option one. That's the hardest for them because they've been taught for years that the other is evil. So whoever the other is is evil, that's the hardest. The second one is they just check out. They just check out, right? The third one is they double or triple down. And now they don't even pay, they put their head to the ground. That's the, and now they, they become stop admitting so ingrained. They're wrong. They just stop admitting they're wrong completely. That's correct. They just totally double down. They're always right. My guy is right or my gal is right because she's got my jersey on. That's it. Doesn't matter. She's wearing the, either the red or the blue jersey. Therefore, she's correct by default. But I want to give them the fourth option. Come to us. There you go. Which segues beautifully in my next um, question. I guess we refer to it a lot as the cathedral, but, you know, Mm -hmm. it's the capital, all the good stuff, but predominantly the media and what people hear nowadays. We get it that they're busy. They're, you know, raising children, earning a living, so on and so forth. So I guess going back to that, putting blinders on and only thinking your side's right, that the fake news thing started off. And then it kind of snowballed into you can only listen to CNN and get the truth or Fox News if you're on the team right. And that's the truth. 
And then it trickles down to social media. You can get canceled if you put the wrong thing on about COVID that you thought was right. So I guess my question for you is, where does the Libertarian Party sit? Do you want to try to penetrate these things or do you think we should create our own or what's the I'll, answer I'll, to let it? Me touch, let me touch uh, this. This goes back to kind of Dane's question also. He's like, Correct. are you worried that the schools are just indoctrinating the kids? I'm not. I mean, I am, but not for this. They are indoctrinating kids. It's absolutely true. It's happening. But right. for your question, I'm not as concerned because most of these kids are getting most of their information from their online social circles, not from the schools. Right. Right. The schools affect them. Don't get me wrong and indoctrinate them. But they actually come up with most of their ideas from their online circles. Right. So what's taught in school, they then go online to the Discord server or wherever they're playing, whatever's their thing or do they do Facebook groups anymore? I don't think kids do that anymore. Whatever. But Whatever I think the, the cool kids are on TikTok kids do. now. Yeah. TikTok, They're showing each whatever, other right? each they other's do. asses and stuff. There we go. Yes, exactly. Right. They're doing that stuff, right? Whatever the kids are doing now. They right. do that thing, right? The thing of the day. They do that type of thing. Right. I think that's where they get a lot of it. And that now goes to what you're talking about, David. We have to penetrate. But we can't penetrate, almost can't penetrate through regular media. We're going to penetrate through social media, through right. niche media. That's what we're going to do. I think we have to. Otherwise, we're not going to be heard. If you, if you notice my show, my show, The Sharp Way, I, I hardly ever have libertarians on. I talk about non-libertarians or I have non-libertarians on. It's a goal is to make that mesh, right? Get other people to see us and us to see them, right? I've had literally Marxists on my show. And libertarians are like, I can't believe people exist. I'm like, they do. They're Lots not hard to find, do. actually. Yeah. <laughs> you got, they, they exist. Yeah. And you should know that they exist for two reasons. One, so that we as libertarians stop telling ourselves lies that we tell to ourselves. Like, everybody wants freedom. That's, what, that's the lie we tell ourselves. Because in our world, that's true. But outside of our world, that's not true. People mm -hmm. love government. I mean, love government. Yeah. Freedom right? is scary. And we... Yes, and we have to understand that so that we can communicate and turn them. They're still our neighbors, our friends, our family members, right? right? So we have to still turn them. So that's why I put people on. I remember one guy actually saying, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna seize the we're gonna seize the assets, we're gonna seize the companies." Just yeah, yeah. I mean, libertarians are like, I can't believe he's saying it. Like that's those people are real. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. I, I, I showed you the guy said it. I remember one guy. <laughs> excuse me, one guy talking about Jeff Bezos. And he goes, yeah, we're going to, you know, we, he's going to give up his money and his company or whatever. I said, okay. So when you take his company, um, does he get to keep any of his money or no? And he's like, well, you know, we'll negotiate. Are you going to negotiate with him? Okay. So you can negotiate with Jeff Bezos. You take his company, then negotiate how much money he's to keep. He's like, yeah. I said, what if Jeff Bezos doesn't want to do that? What if he says no? He doesn't want to do it. Well, he has to. Well, what if he says no? It's interesting. Well, no, we're going to make him. So prison. And he went, Yes. Like, oh. didn't even skip a beat. Yeah, that's a pretty, that's a pretty shitty negotiation. Like, oh, we're going to make <laughs> yeah, an offer. You can't refuse. Play ball or you yes. going <laughs> And he was like, yeah, of course. Duh, yeah. Larry, prison. So then I went further. I said, okay, so you, you put Jeff Bezos in prison. You know, you got Amazon now. Government's running Amazon. I get it. Problem is, at least half of the executive team is not going to want to work for you. You just put the boss in prison and took all his assets, right? So at least half of them aren't going to want to work for you. They're going to quit or they're going to go to the side of the company or retire. He said, no, 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 they have to keep working so the company keep works. Uh -huh. Well, what if they don't want to? Well, no, they have to. So prison for them? To well, the yeah. gulag. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Imagine, like, this, imagine they apply this to like... Yeah. yeah. Right. Imagine they apply this to their, um, you know, sexual counterparts. Oh, we're having sex tonight. Well, I don't really feel like... Oh, we're going to. Like, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. This is uh, happening. Yeah. <laughs> this is happening. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's the bedroom of the gulag, sweetheart. You need, sign, you yeah. need to sign the papers or you don't, but this is happening exactly. Exactly. <laughs> right. yeah. Now, maybe we can negotiate on the time. How about that? Right. Yeah. <laughs> whether, whether it's, whether it's 7 or 7.15, right? Yeah, right, you got a little exactly. window there for take a shower yeah. or something, but that's it. <laughs> yeah. So, Which, is, but, you know. But, but my point being of, of all this chat, <laughs> is to your point, David, yes, I do want us to infiltrate. I really do. I want us to be able to get involved and talk to everybody, people who seem close to us, people who seem far away from us, because number one thing we have to realize is 
we're the only ones who actually have answers and solutions. Yeah. And they don't see that. And they can't see that until we talk to them. Yeah. Now, I think I already know what your answer to this is going to be. Um, and I, I think I agree with you on, on what it's going to be. In the age of COVID, do you think um, this is a net positive? The whole COVID experience has been a net positive for liberty or a net negative? And where I'm coming from with that question is, it could be a positive in the sense that if the cathedral has overplayed its hand, that it turns, you know, it disaffects so many people that maybe they do want your fourth way of saying, okay, I'm not joining the other team because both teams are pretty trashy. So what's my other option? Um, or do you think COVID is more of the frog in the pot situation where people, like you said, they love government? Because at least even if there's not actual security or safety, there's at least the perception of security or safety. And that's what they're after. Um, so what do you think? I, I think if it's obviously if it's the frog in the pot situation, COVID has been a net negative. And if it's the opposite where the cathedrals overplayed his hands and that's a net positive. Where do you come out on that? Um, I think. In the last. Hundred years. I'll say hundred years. There have been four things that have affected this country more than anything else in the last 100 years. First is World War II. After World War II, we've got basically, um, we basically became a world power with a huge government and you know, overseas, military industrial complex. Um, after World War II, we've got everybody on the dole. We have government involved in every aspect of our industry. World War II was the first one. Second was Vietnam. The Vietnam War, Broke the, broke the back of the American dream. That's when people were like, wait a minute. So like this whole thing, what? This doesn't really work? That's when the Vietnam War was the last, was the last war where the wealthy sent their children to war. After that, they stopped. They're like, no more. Draft yeah. went away. Wealthy people stopped sending their kids to war anymore. That, that war became for suckers at that point. That's when we right. realized that war was for suckers. It lost right? its at romanticism point, a little bit. Yeah. All gone. Right. That was the end of that. Right? right. And also right after that comes Nixon and Watergate. And that's when we start to doubt. This is the doubt the the the, the, the other Lots side. Was, correct. Yes. Yeah. Then 9-11. 9-11 is the first time that openly the government said openly, my job is to keep you safe. If you look before that, government didn't say that. The oath that every executive takes is the same oath that I took as a Marine, is to serve and protect the Constitution. I'm sorry, defend and support the Constitution, right. not the individual American. It's not my job to keep every American safe as a Marine. It's my job to make sure the country doesn't collapse, right? The president and the mayor and the governor, same oath. Make sure the government doesn't collapse. That's your goal. That's it. Not protect every person. But 9-11, George Bush said, I got you. I'm going to keep you safe. You go back and shop. You go, shh, go shop, shh, go shop, go shop. Yeah. I'm going to go, I'm going to go bomb some people. You go, you go shop. And we went, okay. And that's the first step because we were scared. After that, it kept going. Obama was doing the same thing. Trump doing the same thing, right? When the, when a crash comes, shh, go back to shopping. We're going to write you some checks. COVID yeah. comes, go in your house. We're going to get your vaccine, write you some checks. And it's still going. That started 2001. Got to keep you safe. Safety's everything. Got No one could die. Got to keep you safe. That only happened after, after 9-11. And then finally, COVID. COVID is, was, shows that the government can do anything. And I mean anything. I want you to think about many states, mine particularly New York State, every morning, Americans got up, turned on their, either their, you know, turned on their computer or the TV to see if the government would allow them to go to work. That happened for over a year in my state. And we didn't fight it. In fact, worse, the government then listed people as essential and non-essential. It decided who was worthy and who wasn't. And what was funny, only people who were worthy were those who worked for the state. Those were the only people who were essential. Nobody else was. The state was more essential than anything else. And you know what we did at seven o'clock here in New York? We went outside from our cells and we clapped for them. I'm not joking, that was the thing. 7 p.m., we would clap for them. Clap for the essential workers. We clap for our jailers. That's what happened. That's called Stockholm Syndrome. 
Yes. Yeah. So to your point, Dane, we are right now at a turning point. If the libertarian movement can't gain traction in the next two to three years, the war is over. That's what I can tell you. The war is over. Well, I was wrong. I started that question saying I, I thought I knew what your answer. I thought you were going to take the more optimistic route. That's I mean, that's I kind of we have a chance. Yeah, but just we have, we have we the have next two or three years. Yeah, but, but just but tie- this is a window. Yeah. This is a window, right? If we can't make impact in these next two to three years, then the next thing, which will be ten or twenty years from it's now, way worse. whether that's the co- another COVID or whether that's a financial crash or Somebody bombs us, police state. But yeah. on a more serious police note, police state. On a more serious note, are you going to be buying Cuomo's book to <laughs> see how he beat COVID? I've already bought. I bought three of them. This way, I can have one when I travel, right? Yes, to review. Yeah. Just a that's reference. That's my travel one, right? right exactly. And that's the one I put. I had the yellow highlights in. Perfect. So when I want to go back, right? So and that's then you're going to make no cards. Correct. No then cards. I have one in the bathroom. So that when I'm, you know, going to the bathroom, I can right. review to keep the notes oh. so I don't forget. I thought right? you were going to use I it just review. in case you ran out of TP or something. No, 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 no. That, that's oh, that's oh. very, very okay. valuable. I got to review that's just sacrilege. in case. So I, oh. I can keep everything <laughs> right, you know, in my head just in case. And then I have one to spare in case for any reason I lose one either in the bathroom or in my bag. So I have three. Oh, well, you are a good citizen, Larry Sharp. I am. <laughs> I, I am obedient. Yeah. He, he was my, I used to call him my Lord and Master all the time, right? King Andrew, Cuomo II, right. my Lord and Master. Yeah. Because yes, he was a king. <laughs> he was. He was in every sense of the word. Well, I mean, yes. except, it, it, except for name only. They loved him all the way up until the end. <laughs> yes. Um, so, you know, kind of winding down here. Um, I, because we like to as much as we, we don't do this every episode because that just it slips our mind. But when we do remember to do it, and obviously having someone like you here, um, we, we want to do it is we try to give people an action item. Like libertarians are very good at pointing out, you know, all the different problems here, there, or whatever. And, you know, like you said, we do have policies for all the different things, but sometimes a policy is different from what what's an action item. What can somebody do in their daily life to take one step? If the frog, you know, slowly boils in the pot and in the bad direction, then people can take incremental steps in the good direction. So what would be your advice to somebody listening to this episode, whether it be fix their own messaging, run for office themselves, whatever it may be, what do you think is is some of the best action items that people could take to to hopefully like that seize that window of opportunity you just mentioned and you know hopefully not go down the path of most resistance? I think what you want to do is try to make yourself stronger. That sounds a little selfish, I know, but it's really important. Well, Larry, I want to give all my time and money and energy to somebody else. I'm glad that sounds amazing, but is that also making you stronger? right? So always invest in yourself first and then others, right? Both invest in yourself first and others. If you're just like, I'm going to go out and sign wave for every libertarian candidate in the world. Awesome. But are you broke now? Yeah, I'm broke. That's not good. Right. Do you have a career path? No. Do you have a girlfriend or boyfriend? No. Do you, are, are you still having friends with your local people? No, I don't have any friends except the online ones where I'm wave doing sign waving. Don't do that. That is a terrible idea. Don't martyr yourself for the cause. Yeah, I mean, because the state's entire model is to make citizens weak so that they're dependent on the state. So to your point, correct. the stronger you so, are, the less susceptible you are to their, their correct. crap. Correct. So the first thing is don't go nuts. Think about what you're good at and what you enjoy, and then how can you bring that to bear? Okay. If you're not good or don't like doing this stuff at all, then it's time for you to start writing some checks. I'm serious, right? If you're someone who's like, dude, I'm busy. I got stuff going on. I don't like any of this stuff. Okay, then work harder and write some checks then because there are people who do need that money so they can go do cool stuff, right? So if you can't go there. But if you're like, dude, I can't write checks. I'm not making that kind of cash. Good, then you got time. Then give somebody some time, right? You either have time or you have money, right? If you don't have either, you're messing up. You need to to fix yourself, right? Because you need to have one of those two, right? Apply your own mask first. Before there we go. Others. That's my point. Fix yeah. yourself. Then my opinion, fix yourself first, then look local, then look national. Right. 
That's my opinion. Fix yourself first. I don't mean to be perfect. Just don't be a disaster and don't martyr yourself. Yeah. And then ask yourself, do I have more time than money or more money than time? If you have more money than time, there might have to check is 20 bucks. People don't ask 20 bucks to a local candidate. That gets them Facebook ads. Right. That gets them door hangers. That's fine. Right. So then write a check. Or support your podcast. You guys have like a Patreon or something? Yeah. Yeah, they can uh, come to the website, wdpodcast.com, and go to our support the show and, and donate to us, buy shirts, you know, anything. There we Absolutely. go. So look, yeah. I don't have that much cash, but I, I don't have any time. Great. You know what? Spend five bucks a month supporting a podcast like this. Right? right? It's fine. Just do it. You, you're doing your part. Go to work. Make your money. Get Make yourself stronger. You got big dollars? Like you, you're, you're making big money? Right? Great. Throw somebody a hundred bucks a month, a thousand bucks a month. If you got the money, it's up to you. What do you got? What can you spare while still not martyring yourself? Yeah. That's the critical thing. Don't martyr yourself. Find that peace without martyring yourself. And the next thing I'll bring up, when you can show up to something, I can't tell you how important it is to just show up. You guys met me at a place. Why? Because I want to show up. We physically right. got together. I saw you. When, when possible, Show up someplace, whether that's local, national, whatever is appropriate. Go to a place that you want to be. You know, I've always wanted to go to that thing. Go to that thing. Show up someplace. Yeah. If you show up, it validates everyone else who thinks they're all by themselves. When you show up, they go, I'm not alone. I'm not crazy. Well, you probably are crazy, but we're all crazy yeah. together. That's fine. <laughs> but yes. So yes, we're all crazy together at least, right? You're not alone. Yeah. So that's an important thing to do. If you're doing that, you're rock and roll. I don't think everybody should be running for office. I don't. I think fewer people running for office, more people supporting them. Right. right. That's what I want. I don't want a libertarian on, on every ballot. I think it's useless. We're going to lose every yeah. ballot. I mean, it, it's... The system, the system is stuck against us, right? Mm -hmm. And the sad part is, no matter what, the most important thing in today's world is to be popular. It's more important than being skilled. It's more important than being savvy. It's more important than being smart. The most important thing is popular. Right. So Especially in the I, world of rather, politics. Yes. Yeah. Literally, it is a popularity contest. Right. Literally. <laughs> an election is literally a popularity contest. That's what it is, right? Yep. So be more popular. And if you aren't that person, then help someone else be popular. Mm -hmm. I've got an idea. Hotter candidates. <laughs> like Larry, yes. we get you in like a windswept kind of thing, chest but hair blowing in the wind. You'll, well, I'm saying. you'll sweep the yeah. governor. <laughs> we'll take Easy the state. Day, I'm in. Exactly. Easy day. I'll get one of them, I'll get one of them blonde wigs that there you go. blow and stuff. Yeah, look like Fabio. I'm in. Put you on a horse. The political it's Fabio, be great. very sharp. Oh, I get <laughs> to be in a horse too. Love yes, it. of course. Yep. <laughs> Pull it all the stops. I, I especially like your 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 breakdown into the because that's that's a very simple concept. Do you have more time or more money? Because you know it just reminds me of that that analogy. You can't pour from an empty cup, you know. So yeah. if you if you are somebody that has more money than time, you know, donate some money. If you have more time yep. than money, you know, like you said, show up, do things. Yeah. So yeah, no, I think those are all very good. And, and you know, and in terms of making yourself stronger, you know, it could be the most simple, mundane things. Learn how to grow your own food. You know, even if even if you're just sleep better, sleep better, drink more water, <laughs> drink more water. I don't exactly. care. Just make yourself stronger. Jazz or something. Get, a, get, a, do get something. a side hustle and do some Uber. I don't care. Whatever's yeah. the thing for you, man. Right. Whatever's exactly. going to make you stronger. Go back to school. I don't know. Learn a trade. Whatever is going to make you stronger in your world. Right. Yeah. Go Perfect. go find some new friends if you need new. If your friends suck, I don't know if you, I hope your friends don't suck. Yeah. But if your <laughs> friends suck, go find new friends. I mean, right. sometimes friends yeah. suck. It does happen. Yeah. So whatever. So I mean, do. I'm saying just make yourself stronger emotionally, physically, financially, because this is to David's point. This is not easy work. This is really hard work, and you're gonna get slapped down, and you got to get back up, and you got to take a punch. And here's the worst part: when it comes to us. People always say, Larry, should I run? I said, let me, let me give you my two cents if you should run. Can you take a knife in the back from somebody who's supposed to be your front on your side? And when they put it in your back, pull it out and go, Ugh, then this is your property? <laughs> Can you do that? Yeah. If you because you're gonna be backstabbed. That is going to happen. Right. Can you do that? Next. 
can you take a punch from someone that is completely unfair? That's not true, not just unfair, unwarranted from someone who's your enemy, and you won't be able to punch back. Can you take that punch? And you go, well, no, don't run. Yeah, I can. Then run. Yeah. Can you run a campaign, a contest, uh, uh, take a test, uh, a competition, knowing that it will be handicapped against you and you will have no recourse? Regardless, no recourse. You will simply run an unfair test, an unfair contest. It will not be fair at all, and you will have no recourse. You can yell, scream, complain, sue, does not matter. You will have no recourse. It will be unfair. Can you do that? And not be bitter. Yeah. They go, yeah, you should run. They say, no, don't run. Support somebody else who can run because that person that you're supporting has to handle all of that. And they could use your support. Because when they get stabbed, when they get punched, when it's unfair, they're going to want to quit. They're going to want to say, "This is not. I'm not doing this anymore. They don't want to come back. And they're going to need you to be there to go, dude, David, it's got to be you, man. You're the guy doing this. We need you to do this, please. I know that I know that Dane guy stabbed you in the back. I know he did. But I'm talking Every to him on the phone now. Every damn week, Larry. I'll, Every I'll, damn I'll week. <laughs> yes, I got him on the phone now. I'm going to calm him down. We need him. We can deal with this. I know that guy did that, said that you, you know, whatever, killed that guy in the back, back of the theater last week. I know you didn't kill a guy. I know they said that, but it's fine. We'll deal with it. We got lawyers. You need to stay in this, David. You need to stay in this. <laughs> yep. We need people to keep David going when all those things happen to him. It's of because of the hair, isn't it? Because when you get out in front, yeah, when you get out in front, it's lonely. Yeah. It's lonely when you're out in front. Yeah. So you really need people around you to be like, I got you. So if you can be that person, be that person. If you can't be that person, support that person because that person can't do it without you. There you go. Yeah. Well, I got to say uh, to all the listeners out there, you know, if you didn't learn a lot from this conversation, I don't know what the hell you're doing with your life, but you need to track down Larry if you're not already familiar with his work. Um, and so where can they do that? Where can they, where can they connect with you, find you, support you? Um, where, where can they get, you know, all the Larry Sharp content that they could ever want? Absolutely. You can just head over to the sharpway.com, right? Sharpway.com is my podcast that I do almost every evening, um, around 7 PM Eastern, give or take. So Sharpway on all the Insta web stuff, everything, Instagram, Twitter, right. Facebook, MeWe, locals. I'm on everything with all the things I'm on all the things. Um, and you can also just go to Larry Sharp, uh, Google Larry Sharp. I have two separate brands, the Sharpway, which is uh, really only the media and then Larry Sharp, which is my more political side, but they okay. both have everything on it and they're all on all the things. And it's Great. sharp with an E and the E stands right. for um, electrifying on a horse. Yeah. There you go. I love it. <laughs> there I love we it. go. Well, not to, not to put you on the spot, but can the good citizens of New York, can they expect uh, a chance to check a check uh, your name in a, well, when, when would be the next gubernatorial election? No, I am considering running for governor next year. I am. I'm Great. absolutely, I'm, okay. I'm looking, I'm looking for support now, seeing what I can put together. Um, in, in New York state, we have a very special thing called fusion voting and in New York state, you can actually run under multiple lines. Okay. So I'm a registered libertarian. I'd have the libertarian line, but if I want to, I can run another primary while being a libertarian. Oh, and cool. literally, if I win, get listed multiple times on the ballot. Awesome. So I'm actually considering running in the Republican primary. Because if I do that, if I, if I lose the primary, which I might, I'm a libertarian, I'm not a Republican. So I might, right. lose the, I might lose the primary. Like Bernie Sanders runs the Democratic primary, even though he's independent. Exactly. It's like that, if that makes any sense. Yes. And he ran, the, he ran in the Democratic primary, but lost. He's still independent. I, it would be, I'd be the same for the Republican Party if I ran. Okay. So, but if I win... Then I get listed Republican and Libertarian. I get listed twice, physically twice on the ballot. Great. Cool. Do they accept mail-in ballots? Because I'll send five in with your name on it if, uh, Please. if they accept yeah, it. We have, we have a lot yeah. of dead relatives, too, that, that right. I'm like, pretty sure we, we check off later. I mean, it's New York. <laughs> vote, vote early, vote often. <laughs> you know, we're, right. we're, we're in Florida, so we're going to do the reverse snowbird. We're going to exactly. move up there, stay up there for six months then a day, get residency, and, and, and cast our votes. So. We're like New York Love microwaved. <laughs> That's all I love it. Is. It makes sense. I love it. Perfect. <laughs> so, well, that's right. awesome, Larry. We thank you very much for your time. Thank you so and much, actually, Larry. I don't know if we told you, you are the first non-honorary guest on the show. Actually, you know, because we 
we did, we always promised grandma she was going to be the first ever interviewee on the show. Um, she was episode 60. Um, this episode, which will be coming out on Monday, this, this coming Monday in a couple days, um, you know, but you are the, the first person out, outside the family that we've ever, um, ever interviewed on the show. So we thank you very much for your time. And, uh, we, like I said, we couldn't have had a better guest for our first go at it. Thanks again, Larry. Awesome. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. All right. We'll talk to you soon. All righty. I mean, we didn't steer you wrong, did we? Was that not a hell of an interview? He I mean, was electrifying. Oh, we did great. <laughs> yeah. you know, we'll never, we'll never miss an opportunity to pat ourselves on the back. That's right. By God, Larry, you gave us a run for your, for our money, with your money and your words of wisdom. Yes. So, so thank you, Larry, for being the first non-family interviewee on Weapons of Meme Destruction. And please go to his podcast and check out all the stuff that he said. Support in any way that you can. And, Absolutely. Um, like he said, either be a Larry. He didn't say this, but we're saying this. Either be a Larry. Get out there, run, participate, act, if that's your skill set, or support the Larrys and the Dane and Davids of the world. Yeah. That are you know trying to win hearts and minds one podcast episode too. at a time. But um, and then again to those mail in ballots, you can get, just grab a stack of them and just send them up there <laughs> in a year with Larry, Larry Sharp, just scribbled all over it. Make up John Smith, John Doe, John Mullaney, John this, that, and the other. Yeah, do all that. Get that man elected, please. New York will be a much better place for it. God yeah. knows. It'll come back a hell of a lot quicker than it's coming back now. He won't be, uh, he won't be, uh, is it, which one was the governor, Chris or? Uh, Cuomo. I know what they were both Cuomo. Cuomo's, but one is an, is an anchor on CNN and the other one was the governor. Chris, I think Chris is the anchor on CNN. Oh God, does it even matter? It doesn't matter, whatever. <laughs> They're Have both it. pieces of poop. <laughs> anyway, point is. Uh, Chris lies, the guy on CNN lies about how much weight he lives and the guy... <laughs> On that was the governor killed a bunch of people you and can, said, "How do I manage?" You can you Michael can, Scott. You can take it to the bank that whichever that Cuomo was that was governor, that, he wasn't a good guy. Larry Sharp will not be like him. He will not be killing grannies and smacking fannies. When you hear your family, <laughs> anyway. Um. So, go to wmdpodcast.com backslash sixty two. Check us out on YouTube. Um, <clears throat> any podcast catcher, uh, you can find us. Episode 62 is where you'll find the Larry Sharp discussion and link up with us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And with that being said, catch us next week on the next installment of Weapons of Meme Destruction. Go perform some actions, you freaking libertarians. Yeah, people stuff. <laughs>